Welcome to Never End the Story, a rewatch podcast where we watch the movies of our childhood, along with Tepper, a grown man who's never seen them before. I'm your host, Ivan, and I'm a Pokemon master. I'm Chris, I'm a speeding train, and a blood red etching of a demon framed. I'm Connor, and I'm a chameleon of hair color. Hi, I'm Tepper, and please call the police. These people have kidnapped me. I require immediate assistance. Enough of that. Uh, this week we will be watching Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, directed by Robert Stevenson, released in 1971. This was the last Disney brand film to receive an Academy Award until The Little Mermaid in 1987, oh, 1989. Connor brought this movie to us. Why? This was, as there is a trend, one of those movies I watched a lot as a child. But as a child, I uh, I didn't realize a lot of what was going on until I read a synopsis of this movie when I was much older and I was like oh it was a a really weird wave of realization I'm sure we'll talk more about that later uh does anyone else have a personal connection to this film no I've I've never seen nor had I heard of this before we started talking about doing this episode you're in for a treat a pa- oh, I, man. from what I hear this is probably my second favorite childhood movie until the point where I got to start choosing the movies I watched at the very least. Um, this along with, this was like obviously behind Chi Chi Bang Bang as my number one. Then there was this and it wasn't until probably 10 years after first seeing this one that I saw Mary Poppins. So this was very much my Mary Poppins, which some people seem to care about. We are now showing Tepper the movie poster for the first time. Tepper, what do you think this movie's about? Huh. Describe the poster. Um, There's a lot going on. There is a man on a fish line. The... Wow. <laughs> <laughs> He's the, overwhelmed. The mind boggles. <laughs> um, there are random kids on a bed with their mother. Or at least I think that's the mother. Um, there are animated fish. Um, there is... And then that, that, like, the bottom, like, three quarters of the poster are, like, water containing this. And then the upper part of it... Is has uh, is an island with a jungle in the background, with several uh, animated characters: a rhino, a hyena, an alligator, a bear, a lion, a monkey, an uh, ostrich, and I don't know what type of bird that is. Yeah, a business bird. Yeah, some kind of like accountant yeah. bird. Um, and then at the top it says you'll be, you'll be, you'll be, <laughs> you'll be bewitched. You'll be bedazzled. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. It does not say that. <laughs> this poster is now a crime against posters. <laughs> the text is horrible. What the hell? It's so you'll easy to You'll be witched, and you'll be dazzled. A most magical adventure beyond anything before. Inside, dead, open. <laughs> uh, a most, yeah, most magical adventure beyond anything before. Walt Disney Productions, bed knobs, and broomsticks. Uh, and at the bottom, it just has uh, some of the credits. What do you think this movie's about? I don't know, man. <laughs> what do you mean you're not getting anything from this? <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, like, the only thing I can think of is that this, similar to every almost almost every single other movie we've watched in this podcast so far, there's some real-world fantasy crossover. Please. I can't imagine what would give you that Please idea. Please, make the pain end. Who's the main character? Make it end. Um... 
Oof, who is the main character? Children are usually a good go-to for main characters, especially following the trend we've been going. Um, yeah, I'll go with like one of the kids, I think. One of the kids or the, uh, the dad. Alright. You can collectively say the children are the main character, that's perfect. Yeah, fun. yeah, so I guess I'll say that, like, the children are the main character. Either the children or the dad are the main characters. Um. Yeah. You are gonna be surprised by the family dynamic in this movie. Amongst many other things. <laughs> this is a progressive movie. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Yeah, those fish are raising those children, <laughs> and that man is married to that bed. <laughs> this is the future that liberals want. <laughs> Thanks, Obama. Um, oh, I suppose should we warn Tepper ahead of time? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus fuck. <laughs> and with that, we'll see you after the film. That's my nightgown. Is it really, my dear? Yes, and I'm not responsible for its behavior. Obviously not, my dear. And we're back. So, what did everyone think? Uh. Uh. The best thing ever, right? Oh yeah, cringing and like whinging and moaning. <laughs> I. That's a good sign. I want. I want to like this movie, but I was fucking bored the whole time. <laughs> I was so, so bored. Oh, God, I just wanted it to end. It was so painful. The pacing of this movie was just horrible. And I was just bored. Nothing was happening except in, like, there's only, like, a couple parts where, like, stuff happened. And... <sighs> kids hey i'll hear no ill will towards paul and carrie and charles sure paul was the only good one what oh yeah paul the young one is paul yeah 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 that dude like star of the show well he was the he he got everything done I, I couldn't disagree with you more, though, Tepper. I think this was great. This is, like, a Ugh. good version of Mary Poppins. Um, oh, I love that movie so much. The, it's so good. The only part that, like, there were a couple parts where I was bored. The animated part, like, that was a snooze fest to me. Like, Oh, yeah, that was. Okay, we're going to have some, we're going to have some goof-em-ups in is Animal the, World. Is that the entire animated part? Yes. Or including the underwater part in the yeah. lagoon? Yeah, that was dumb, too. That was like, okay, fine. Uh, we are in the animated hell section that uh, Mary Poppins also had. <laughs> this one was better, but... Uh, <laughs> bobbing Along was actually cut from Mary Poppins. It was originally meant for it. Oh my god, that makes so much sense. I used to sing that song all the time as a child. Yeah, it's <laughs> one of the best. Fucking twirling around my living room. So probably, like, to give some more, like, con... I don't like movies like this. It has been established that you don't like good movies. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like movies where the Nazis lose. It makes sense. <laughs> that that ending part was actually really good, though. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's um, yeah. I, I just, I just didn't, I just didn't really like it. I thought it was, um, I thought it took way too long to get going. I wasn't really enthusiastic about, like, any of the characters, really. Like, I thought they were, like, all right, but uh, there wasn't, like, really... There wasn't anything engaging, and there were some sections just just felt like they went on forever. That dance section, uh, dance and song section in the market was so excessive. Yeah, Portobello Road was kind of an interminable amount of time where we just saw every dance from around the world eventually. Yeah, it was like, yeah, it's, like, it's what fine. The f- Not everyone's a history buff. Not what? everyone can enjoy World War II history. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, like it, it, it was neat, but it was just kind of like, okay, it's going. I'm like, all right, it's going to... No, it's still going. All right, all right, it's still going. 
weren't they here for a book? Yeah, why did they go to Portobello Road during the spontaneous street dance festival? To be fair, yeah. he's the uh, Professor Brown is the entire reason there was a, a spontaneous dance. That's true. And then all the soldiers were just there to get their dicks wet. Okay, so this movie is a whole bunch of random parts stitched together into like a giant, nasty, disgusting abomination. This movie is a perfect masterpiece, and you are blatantly yeah, wrong. I thought it was fun. Yeah, I, I don't know. It was I, a I, fun little adventure, and you are just salty you couldn't go on it. <laughs> I just... It's a product of its time with how slow a lot of the scenes are, but other than that, like it holds up very well. I was actually like surprised by how much I still enjoyed that movie, because I really thought I was going to be bored, but like... There were some scenes that really dragged on, but I was still just like, overall, this is an enjoyable experience. There, Yeah, there, there is something to be said about a movie that you put on for a child because the child also has a toy in front of them. So the entire movie is going to be enjoyable for them no matter what. But yeah, it was still, it was still very good. We were all commenting in the bubbling, what's, that, what's the one I didn't like? bobbing along bobbing along uh in that scene we were all commenting that the integration between the animated and the um live action parts was really good especially as compared to what we just saw in rockadoodle yeah, oh god yeah they, the end of rockadoodle was horrid so what from what i can tell they had painted backdrops and they worked really well for them rather than a green screen which was obviously not a widely used technique in 1971 yeah yeah, no, it was it was a lot better. Um, so, like the last like twenty, like the whole last sequence with the uh, Germans, the Nazis. Yeah, like that was really well done with like the armor and like the way they did the armor and everything. Like it was uh, so like directing and like uh, like technical aspects of it seemed very well done. Like. Uh, like the, the lighting was good. Like the sets the, were beautiful. The costumes, yeah, the sets beautiful. were great. The costumes were perfect. Uh, the music and stuff like that. The dances, well choreographed, well executed. Like no complaints from me really on the technical aspect of it. If if anything else, like it was like like the dance session, like yeah, like the the roads, um, Portobello Road, way too long. But like the dancing and everything was really good, um, yeah. Like the 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 are the battle section with the with the Germans for me that was the best part of the movie. Like that was was really cool. It was funny, but yeah, I, I think like I really found like some scenes just just went on too long. The movie was way too slow. Like and like <sighs> slow movies don't bother me. Like, I've watched slow movies before, but I just wasn't engaged in this one. And, like, if a slow movie doesn't engage you, uh, I mean, you're you're just going to check out. And, like, I I just wasn't into this movie. Just, I think at one point, uh, John, you moved the mouse and it said 40 minutes had gone by. And I, like, just was like, 40 minutes and nothing's happened. Um... I felt like it took them way too long to get to London. They, they discover magic is real. <laughs> like the movie, the movie takes its time <laughs> doing stuff, but like, you know, yeah. Um, I think because we have experienced like Nanny McPhee and Harry Potter and like everything that came in the lineage of this, this probably seems like pretty fucking boring. Like comparatively, she's got like three spells. And she can't even kill anybody with them. The Nazis don't even shoot people. <laughs> I mean, that wasn't even was a mischief on right. my list of complaints. Like, I thought the magic part of it was fine. Like, it, it was it was cool. Like, you know, she's an apprentice witch. Um, yeah, I just found I found the the, the pacing was just just murdered this movie for me. And then also like, I found the scenes in some cases didn't like flow well together like like i said it was just kind of like here's a bunch of like sammy related things and like go and like like the whole like the the animal island just 
was so boring. As soon as I saw Paul hanging out with his book about Animal Island, I was like, oh shit. <laughs> We're going to go there, aren't we? Of course we are. Well, and like... That king, I didn't... That The gags with the king were like, oh, he's loud and angry, did not land and were dumb. I thought that was like... Yeah, no, I, I didn't... I, not a single, like, laugh from me. I still don't know, like, was Astaroth real, or was that in a... Was that, like, where did the kid's book come from? The kid's book came from the same place that her book came from, which is probably not Astaroth. They are, it is a, it is a different dimension where things cannot travel between except for plot convenience. Yeah. And also like the, the bookkeeper, like, like that whole scene in there was really, or the bookman, sorry. I liked him. was like, I liked him, but he just kind of showed up and then left. And like, that wasn't in the movie enough. Like we don't like, yeah. Who's the villain of this movie? See, and that the is Nazis. part of my and that is part of my problem is like there's nothing connecting these scenes in any like really significant way I I found. Like yeah, you there's could point to six like six villains in this movie. You could point to like certain <laughs> plot threads, but like yeah, I just was like 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 he it was like, "Oh, cool, like maybe that will be a cool villain." Like they're both going for the spell. No. Gone. And I was like <sighs> Not being a mother is the villain of this movie. Yeah, like like <laughs> like I said, I love the technical aspects of this movie, and I can understand why people like this movie. Um, I think this is a good children's movie. I don't think this is a bad movie. I was just so bored with this. Okay. This did not engage me at all. All right. So Tepper thought it was boring. I I, I want to talk about the filth children. Like Carrie, Charles, and Paul. I have a lot of questions about them. Okay. Like, why do they all have different accents? Why, why do they like their immediate dry? All they want to do is go back to London and die with their parents, who are probably already dead, but maybe not. Yeah, th- it's very oblique. In like, it never really tells you if their parents are alive or dead. They're either dead or less interesting than Witch Mom. I mean that's that's it's pretty hard to be more interesting than Witch Mom. Yeah, especially during the war. Um, th- like all British teenagers, they immediately become like reenactors. Like wh- as soon as they're left alone, they just pick up armor and weapons and start like fucking around with them. Yeah, I mean there's there's little else to do in that castle. Not like they have Game Boys. Um. Yeah. So there's like Carrie, who's the responsible one. Who has kind of a um, like a normal, uh, average British accent, and then you have Charles, who is kind of a little sociopath, and like seems like he wants to be an old Cockney con man, but is trapped <laughs> in the body of a eleven year old. He's turning really twelve good. this year. Like he just walks around going like, "Oh, that's me, I is. You got a shiny penny? I'll black your boot, won't I?" And just like. What are you talking about? You're eight. Well, well, and like, she's a witch. Like, not like, oh, that's cool. She can do magic. No, I mean, let's black me. Oh, yeah. It's like, fucking Christ. I like this kid's style. <laughs> this is Charlie's only acting credit. <laughs> wow. Yeah, just. Yeah, like the. Crazy to think he didn't continue on with his career. Um, and then, like, my main question about Paul is why is no one concerned that he carries around a shard of glass? Because <laughs> he's because... like, oh, oh, I have things that are helpful. Here's a giant shard of blue glass. And he puts it down on the table, and it is a sharp, like, he smashed a bottle and kept a gouger, you know? I mean, it's the only thing left of their house. Oh, oh, no. Um, when they go to Portobello Road... Nobody seems very concerned. Like, that is London under the bombings. Yeah. And everybody seems fine with it. Let's just dance in the street. Yeah. That's why they have to be home after dark. Paul only also only has one actor credit. Uh, but Carrie is actually a relatively prolific actress. She kept going until 2001. Oh, wow. 
mostly TV. Cool. Yeah, I mean, why would you? Why wouldn't you want to be in London? It's where all the people leave to find lions, witches, and rope wardrobes. Yeah, that's also outside of London, isn't it? Yep. This this movie for like something that scarred the British psyche so indelibly. This movie's pretty flippant about like it's very cheerful and uh, goofity about Nazis and British people and how they dealt with that. I mean, it was made like thirty thirty year roughly thirty years after thirty years after the start. Oh, oh, it's it's also. It's based upon a book written in 43 and 45. There's two books. Yeah, yeah, like the the section with the yeah, with the Nazis was pretty <laughs> well, I like how you uh you described it, John, where it was uh, let me find it. Look, yeah, uh yeah, that guy just has a mischief mortar. It's like they've got mischief guns. Yeah, well they were there they were they were on a mischief raid. He told them so. Yeah, they're just causing mischief, guys. Well, they want to send a warning to Britain that, like, the Germans could show up at any minute. But are disciplined enough to not shoot people or rabbits. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So, Miss Pierce, uh, coming into town to get her witch supplies, finds out she's been civically ordered to take some in some kids from London. Then it turns out she witch. Kids try to blackmail her. Uh, doesn't work so much because she uses her like cantrip uh, to turn the sociopath child into a rabbit, which is her go-to move. No, um, it's not. It's not so much a cantrip because she never remembers it without her spell book. Oh, f- fair. <laughs> Very true. Um. Also, uh, cosmic creepers. Best cat name. Oh. That was the name he came with. Uh, in exchange for not telling somebody that that witches are real and she is one, uh, Paul is given the power of vague travel. Oh, the power to travel through the uh, Grateful Dead universe. <laughs> Those transport sequences are a little difficult. They're disorienting. Uh, because because. Uh, Little Witch Correspondence is shut down. They go to London. They meet the con artist, uh, Professor Brown, who's a great character, other than his sexism, but it's not the worst, I guess. Yeah, this movie wants to tell you a lot about how women can't, like, remember things, or what was the other thing? That they lose things all the time? They're not organized. Right. Yep. They lose things all the time. Mm Mm-hmm. And they have bad memory. Yeah, and they also defend Britain from the fucking Nazis, Brown, okay? Yeah, but only with the help of a man. <laughs> uh, behind behind every great battle sorceress. Tur- tur- <laughs> <laughs> Turns out magic is real still. So we go to find the book. It is in... The mansion of the unexploded bomb. Uh, there's a scene of a fancy nursery where Peter Pan was probably stalking. And then we find out that the book doesn't have the last spell. So to Portobello Road for a delightful... A 15 minute dance sequence. <laughs> through failed book findings. And one great villainous thug character. He yeah. just has the look down. I wish there was more of him. As soon as I saw him, I was like, ooh, what's this guy up to? Uh, after the musical dance number and the closing of Portobello Road, presumably forever. By the bell ringing man. Yeah. Uh, it's a good thing there wasn't a bell during the music, otherwise everyone would have packed up. It's a night time. They have to go back home or else the bombs will drop on them. Yeah. I mean, ba- basically. <laughs> if you're out of the streets at night, you're fine. We'll just dance in zigzag patterns. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, <laughs> uh, so then we meet Mr. Bookman by by Switchblade. And he is surprised to see bed and women and children and magic books. That henchman is so ready to stab children. <laughs> like I mean, he's all, all about it. All good henchmen are. <laughs> I'd rather use my own sentimental, you know, like <laughs> line where he's got the knife. Like, where do you find your henchmen? Obviously, not at high quality establishments uh, like Bookman. Also, does. also like. Bookman was like, like, like. Well, sorry, the the witch was like, yeah, like, let's work together and figure out the spell. And he's like, I'm going to take out my knife now and menace you. And it's like, uh, all right, like, I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, Later, like, nerd. she she's planning to fight Nazis. This guy is small game. Uh, but neither book has the spell we need. If only there was a magic island in an earlierly found child's comic book, but I guess not a comic book. That's the wrong word. But it was a thin. It was a thin child's uh, picture book. That was also kind of stupid. Like, oh, you know, like that part of the movie. Yeah, you didn't need to do that. It was in this book the whole time. It was like, uh, hey, right? we haven't gotten there yet. Sorry, that that it just reminded me of something else that bugged the shit. We out of get me. a great scene in an animated world that has no payoff, and isn't well a great visual scene. Very well choreographed. Uh, there are various animals wearing pants and or not pants. Uh, the, the sort of like body horror island of Doctor Moreau history of the magic book that there was like some asshole sorcerer who imprisoned animals but made them intelligent? He kept animals in cages in hopes to make them more human-like. Yeah, like, did magical experiments on them until they overthrew his disgusting yoke and, like, presumably slaughtered him and took his magic star, which has the words of the last spell on it. Yeah, the spell that makes inanimate things animate, like animals, I guess? I don't, it's kind of vague. It seems like it's supposed to be the spell that made them, but that doesn't really make sense. That doesn't make any sense at all. No. Uh, with a with a quick triple tap and slight turn of a of a knob of a bed, we find ourselves in the lagoon of Nabumbu or whatever, something close to that. All that stuff happens. There's a soccer and or football match, depending if you are an animal or a person. <laughs> And the the medallion is the star of Asmodeus is stolen, and then we find ourselves back in the in the house. But oh wait, the eye of Agamotto is gone, and the magic was in you all along, and also within the child's book somehow, because some person. Because obviously Asmodeus was the one that made the book. Like. Well, I don't know. Was Asmodeus an animated character? Or did he create an animated world and was therefore able to deem what was animated and what wasn't? I don't know, man. This is not something we go into detail in this movie. Anywho. uh, A nice scene of dancing and strangling and a good good line of that's my nightgown and I'm not responsible for its actions. Uh, we will find the secret to substitutionary locomotion is a nice da- a nice singing and dancing number. But they're unprepared. And also, this is almost a happy family, so the con artist has to fuck it up. So he leaves. And then Nazis. Yep. Just and- <laughs> as Miss Pierce had been predicting all along. Out of nowhere, f- fucking Nazis. At an hour and 40 minutes, we find the Nazis, just like... Suddenly Nazis. Just like in The Sound of Music. Uh, They are captured, and they're, they're real hot shit about their stuff, though, because they know magic. But oh wait, Miss Pierce is bad at things. So she doesn't magic, and then they get put into a castle... And then a rabbit that's actually Mr. Brown finds them and is like, these kids were right. I don't have a reason to be here. You should magic. So they do that. And then there's 
definitely the best scenes of the movie very well choreographed very good special effects and quite humorous as a bunch of suits of armor beat up some nazis yeah the entire history of warfare um who all hate the scottish uh like yeah basically the germans fight a ren fair 100 percent historically accurate movie and it's good it's like there's a lot of good physical gags in there yeah it's real good uh and then the old folks show up and are like we did it and then turns out the con man who finally found purpose and a family joins (laughs) the war effort and leaves to presumably die that was such an amazing like bait switch because basically he's like oh i've gotten over my fear of commitment and now i'm going to be your father well i'm gonna go die in a fucking trench now I mean, it's what their father probably did. Ooh. He's just being a good father. It's World War II, so he might not die in a trench. Oh, right. He might just die in a tank or, like, under a tank or... Or in the air. Yeah. You know. Or in a boat. Or, like, during yeah. training. I don't imagine he's going to be particularly adept to any of this. Maybe yeah. he's in, like, the... Enter- Maybe he's, like, doing USO shows. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was like that was his one talent was music. The fucking Joy Division. I mean, the first time he attempts to cast a spell for real, he does it better than Eglantine has ever done. Yeah, it lasts a long time. It's because I he's feel a man. Like that was major plot. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> of course it is. Like it's very clear that had men been witches from the beginning, Nazis would have never come to power. Take that, women. <laughs> they aren't even the best at being witches. Yeah, I, I do want to reiterate something I said during we were watching of this. This is basically Hellboy. Yes. Yeah. This is like magic versus Nazis. Yeah, that's Hellboy. This is Mike Mignola's Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. <laughs> now, that would be something I'd be more likely to read or watch. The weirdest part. It's because you have poor taste. The weirdest part is probably the fact that uh, the, no- the, the Nazi officer didn't believe in magic i thought that was a prerequisite to joining the nazis yeah i thought we were gonna have some kind of like nazi magic showdown but but Ooh, that would have been good. but like i don't know it's about like british people love their like um their history of especially in the 70s like holy shit that was the entire renaissance of like neo-paganism right so um like yeah they love that stuff it's the the red the red skull just shows up <laughs> oh man miss pierce versus the red skull i'd watch that enough said i'd like to see her go up against sorcerer's apprentice mickey too do you think if she turned him into a rabbit his head would still be red oh like a terrifying skull rabbit <laughs> yes can we make that in taxidermy ew <laughs> <laughs> I know my present for Shauna this year. Oh. (laughs) Because you love taxidermy. I got you this crime against nature. (laughs) Don't you love it? Um, While we're talking about rabbits, I have a PSA. Uh, Don't grab rabbits by the ears. That's not a thing you should do. That's bad for rabbits, and it hurts them a lot. But what if they're actually people? Mm, um, What if they're lecherous people? Like, I think she was, she felt perfectly in her right there. If it was a real rabbit, I'm sure she would have never done that. Yeah, if your goal is to cause harm, then by all means, grab rabbits by the ears. I guess I should rephrase my statement. (laughs) Yeah, it's important for PSAs to inform how to properly harm as well as to avoid it. (laughs) That would be a great stay alert and stay safe. Like, if you want to get murdered, open your door to strangers. (laughs) Leave your car unlocked if you'd like it to be stolen. If you if you expect suspect someone's a vampire, invite them in. Ah, oh, Eglantine. Not a name I have ever heard anywhere else. It's like a witch name, I guess. J.K. Rowling I'm wishes name she came all up with all twelve that. of my children Eglantine. Eglant- <laughs> all twelve. Yeah. All twelve children. I'm definitely going to have. That seems likely. Oh my god. Oh, I just read on IMDb the uh, some of the plot keywords for this movie. 
spell, magic, apprentice, witch, bed. <laughs> I mean, the bed is key to the movie. Um, it's a magic bed. Are are you having twelve of them? Are you like are you having a dozen because the name starts with egg? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's how you have children, yeah, right? Checks out. I mean, you obviously you have like six kids or whatever, and you name them Charlie, Carrie, Paul, and then the three characters from uh, *Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe*, and you have them fight for your affection. Also, see which, which one. Which is the better movie? Yeah, it's the only way to settle just dis- the dispute. I'd I'd pit uh, Soccer King versus Aslan. I'd see that fight. They're basically both Jesus. They're b- <laughs> oh yeah, very much so. The Christian allegory in this movie is very strong. <laughs> His name is King Leonidas. Is it really? On all the promotional material, yes. Within the movie, he's just referred to as like King Leo. That's strange. It's a strange choice to make. I mean, in order to defeat the Nazis, one must first defeat the, Sp- the Spartans. It's just the way history works. Yeah, it's too bad you don't know more about history, Tepper, so you could really enjoy this movie. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, no, like I said, I, I, I wanted to like this movie, but... Then like it. No. No, because I was fucking bored. God, You're I bored really I... easy. Like, I have ADHD and I still loved it. I mean... I don't get bored easy. I just don't like this movie. I feel like, to some degree, you chose to not like this movie. It's it's also one of the longer ones we've watched. It is. It comes in just under two hours. Yeah. That's because it had to. Yeah, I mean the pacing required it. Um, We haven't really talked about the bed, uh, so we've added another um, sort of magic vehicle to our uh, canon of DeLorean, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and Falcor. The bed was great. The psychedelic travel bed. When, he, when the kid throws it down the stairs, basically, <laughs> into the bookman's uh Sorry, God, uh, no one room. told me about the, the stairs. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> oh, man. So when she was doing the broom stuff at the very start, do you guys know about, like, flying ointment? Uh, somewhat and like the history like the sort of the speculative history of of which is riding brooms and shit like that i've heard no. i've heard a bit of it but i but i wouldn't be able to describe it so okay so um this is all there is no very good hard evidence about all of this but there are sort of um there are mentions of flying ointment in a bunch of different te- texts from history and different applications for it like you put it on your broom or you put it on an animal and then you ride the animal and sort of the modern speculation is that it like and you can find recipes for this shit most of them are deadly poisonous um but some of them are like have hallucinogens and stuff in them and uh sort of the modern speculation is that you put it on a broom uh and then you ride it uh nude and uh, you get some of that hallucinogen up in your um, mucous membranes, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. I heard about this in my drug course in my undergrad. Yeah, hell yeah. And that's like the flying on brooms it's and riding what broomsticks. Riding a broomstick's about. Yeah, riding a broomstick to the Sabbath. And like uh, often people in the Middle Ages would describe like, uh, yeah, like we flew. Like I went to the witch thing or like we rode pigs and we flew. And the idea is like, oh, no, they were tripping balls. And very good with poisons. Like, they knew exactly how much to administer to not kill themselves. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, because she, there is a little bit at the start of this where she's instructed to ride the broom, like, side saddle, because it's ladylike. But uh, she's like, no, no, I know what I need. Need some of that broom right up in there. I mean, it's before she had met a, a man, so he needed something. <laughs> so disorganized. Unless she breaks it. Um, yeah, it's a magic bed. I Does it st- It stays made for the entire movie. Yes. They made it really well at the beginning. Yeah, it's it, it's really just, this movie is just a two-hour PSA of why you should make your bed. 
you never know. It's embarrassing to fly around in an unmade bed. Mm-hmm. I do really like the like the effect of the uh, the bed poles as it, at the like screech forward and then pull back. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of good puppetry with inanimate objects in this. I mean, obviously from the inanimate object like animation spell, but also the bed was a very. I think you mentioned someone said the bed was like their favorite character or something like that in the chat. The special effects actually apparently made it very difficult to act in this movie because everyone had to do exactly what they needed to do to get the special effects to work right. Yeah, huh. Angela Lansbury actually hated uh, how this movie was filmed. She called it by the numbers acting because the movie was storyboarded like shot for shot. Oh, wow. But there was so much special effects because so they had to do it that way. Or else they couldn't pull it off at the time. Yeah, she she's very like she's, despite all of her, she's a woman. Uh, she's just, she really takes like no nonsense from pretty much anybody, mm-hmm. and like like she'll she'll put up with annoying people until until they just like w- just won't stop, and then the, well, and then like, they're a rabbit. Yeah, that was one thing I really liked about the library scene uh when he wouldn't when um brown wouldn't leave her alone about doing like a like a magical act and then just like it cuts away it cuts back and he's a rabbit i was like yes very good yeah yeah that was very that was a very good transition uh well i want that cat i want that greasy mangy cat what a mangy looking fucking cat. Like I just every time I saw it I was like that cat just crawled out of a dumpster and into another dumpster. I mean <laughs> So Mr. Brown sent that cat to her in the mail. I imagine oh, like yeah. packaged the same way as the broom. Oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> Where did he get this magic cat? It's not a magic cat. He got it off the street. Jesus, I do not understand like, he this. He didn't movie. buy a cat. He's a con artist. He's seducing women with the promise of magic. I mean, aren't we all? (laughs) You'll have to buy my book to find out. (laughs) So, yeah, I guess um, our murder bullies are Nazis, but they're but it's kind of weird because they show up at the very end. Uh, They're not like super murderous. There weren't really villains in this movie. The cat. I guess the cat is our is our murder bully. What? No, the cat's like a member of the family. Also trying hey, to murder Charlie. Murder bullies can be part of the family. I mean, Charlie totally deserved it. Like, I would have shed no tears if the cat just ate him as he was a rabbit. Oh, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about when he was a rabbit, and you're just like, just eat him. Um, we kind of have a business dad. Mm. He's he's, he's con like, business. Yeah, dad. he's like a magician or a con artist dad. He's more That's... of a he's more of a deadbeat dad than a business hey, dad. He owns two businesses. He owns a suitcase and a correspondence course. Uh, I, I'm sorry, he closed down the correspondence course. Yes, because he due to the war. Yeah, because he's a responsible business owner. Mm. He didn't he didn't want his employees to think have he is. something. He's he's barely a business and barely a dad. Yeah, but that's why he like I he's definitely low on the list. And like I mean like Miss Pierce is not a bu- a business dad. She's a witch mom, which is I guess a new category. <laughs> the nuclear family. Very progressive. Yeah, you, so your original theory about who was on this poster, it was very entertaining to me. Three orphans, a con man, and a sorcerer. <laughs> oh, I suppose I should tell everyone for their own benefit. Uh, the warning that we didn't give Tepper before the movie was that this movie is a musical. Just so everyone's aware. Surprise! It's a Disney movie, and we compared it to Mary Poppins. Like, it should have been kind of obvious. Uh, it's true. Yeah, like, for the same time. I, I never watched Mary Poppins, right? So Mary Poppins is a musical. Spoilers. How would how and also it's a Disney movie. That? Musicals are what Disney did at the time. I was focused on this movie that I hadn't heard anything about. Um. So, 
where does this movie fall on your list of Tepper's Tops? Yeah, so... <sighs> A tough one. I think I'm going to put this one last. Whoa! Oh. Brutal. Not, again, not because it's a bad movie. Um, but just because it's the worst of... <laughs> like, like, like if I was to rate this movie on, like, technical aspects alone, it would be very... I'd probably put it ahead of Warriors of Virtue. But I just... I didn't like it. I just did not like it. It did not connect to me. It did not engage me. It didn't do basically anything for me there was maybe like 20 minutes total in that movie where i was like into it um so yeah like i think i'm gonna put this thing last unprecedented in that this is the first time we've added a movie to the list (laughs) yeah and then the other change i was thinking about making to the list because uh where's where's rockadoodle and uh uh, what is Chitty Chitty Bang Bang at? Rock Noodle is four, and Chitty Chitty yeah. Bang Bang is five. All right. Uh, I'm thinking about switching the position of those two. You realize that there was no excuse in 1991 for the animation? <laughs> <laughs> a, a bit of that, but I was also thinking about the movie some more. Um, and I also, like, about, like, Rock and Doodle, and also about, like, what I thought about Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And like, I think, I think I just think Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is a better movie than Rockadoodle overall, because I was I was like looking in, into because I was just curious about Rockadoodle. So I like I read some like other critical rece- like the critical reception for it and like a few other things. And um, I think I gave I was way too lenient on the movie because I hadn't watched like a Disney animated movie in quite a while. Yeah. Uh, and also I have like a, like a huge fondness for that era of animation. Well, apparently so I not think this I, one. No. <laughs> um, so I think I let it off real easy. Uh, whereas Chi Chi Bang Bang is just, I think a better put together movie than Rockadoodle. So yeah, swapping the spots on those two. All right. I'll allow it. Cause I love Chi Chi Bang Bang. <laughs> I figured you'd be pleased by that. I mean, I enjoy Rockadoodle as well. It's one of my other childhood movies that's on this list, but yeah, yeah, like Rockadoodle was was like fine. It just like when I thought about it some more, I realized like it just has like a couple issues that stop it from being better than um, a Choo Choo Bang Bang. I feel all right, and like yeah, this movie I just yeah, just did not connect to. So I've got a tough question and an easy question for you. Which villain are we putting on the list and where are we putting it on the list? Which I can... Oh, God. The second one's uh, probably pretty easy. But who's going on the list? So, I mean, to, uh, to recap, number bringing in number one slot forever is Komodo. Woo! We love you, Komodo! <laughs> number two... Woo-hoo! The main redeeming feature of of Rocky Doodle, Duke of Owls. Coming in at number three, bringing him a body bag is Cobra Kai. <laughs> uh, crashing in at the number four spot is Biff. Uh, not being a postal worker is Van Pelt at number five. Number six, uh, we've ca- caught all the children. And bringing up the current rear is Gamork. Why is Kamork at the end? That makes no sense. He doesn't really do anything, I think, was Tepper's. <laughs> yeah. uh... But he's so cool. Yeah, well, um, the people who were there for when I was rating it uh, last time is I kind of put like an asterisk for Kamork where I said, like, he's a really cool villain uh, conceptually and um, like his appearance, but he just doesn't do anything. Uh, so, like, I, I couldn't really rate him above anybody else yeah. on the list. Whereas that. the child catcher is conceptually an excellent villain, but and just does a tiny bit more. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, he, he actually, you know, does stuff and isn't just immediately killed when he shows up. Yeah. When it was the villains of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, it was like, they're not very memorable. It was like, what about this specific villain? So, yeah. which specific villain are we choosing? Do we choose Nazis. Nazis? 
book bookmen, women, <laughs> grease cat. I mean, none of them, none of them really deserve to be on a build list because most of them, like at most, like I guess like the Nazis are around for the longest, but. Um, I feel like we'll eventually get more Nazis on the list, so should we, we should quali- <laughs> qualify this as mischief Nazis. <laughs> mischief Nazis. All right. Mischievous Nazis. To, with their mischief mortars. To be fair, and their mischief like, guns. we could go with Mr. Book and the Henchman. Or Bookman and the Henchman. Uh, like. They're very menacing. Like They kind of obliquely threaten to stab a child, but they don't really follow through on it. I mean, apparently, apparently he's gone through much worse uh, in order to get this far. Yeah, I don't well, believe, like, believe that. They show up for like five minutes. I'm not saying they're, I'm not saying they're long-term villains, but yeah, yeah, they're almost more. They're basically more villainous than the Nazis. I kind of <laughs> just want to see the words "mischief" Nazis on the list, though. So yeah, I mean, like, like, yeah. Because I guess we have to have a villain from this movie. I personally don't feel like any of them are really, like, thing. But, yeah, I guess, yeah, so... Mischief Nazis are probably ones I would choose because they actually show up for more than, like, five minutes. All right. And the stunning reveal, where do they land on Tepper's tops? Yeah, like, I'm gonna put uh, Mischief Nazis right at the bottom of the list. Like, yeah, like, they just... Um... They're not threatening enough. They don't show up for enough of the movie. They're just Nazis. Like, they're not anything special. Yeah, like, I mean, if we had a Hunger Games where the Mischief Nazis came up against Cobra Kai, Ooh. like, they they would stand no chance. Yeah, yeah. See, Cobra see, Kai and... never dies. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I'm aware, that is a factual statement. Yeah, like, um, in in the Hunger Games, Mischief Nazis would do pretty damn well. Um, I mean, but... we don't have proof of that. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. They, they were bested by, like, a rabbit. Yeah. But, I mean, like, they were going up against armor that couldn't be killed by bullets. I think, you know I I think mean? Van Pelt kills all the Mischief Nazis. <laughs> I think Van Pelt, one Ooh, man, takes... Yeah. Like, I think once we start yeah. getting above Childcatcher on this list, uh, they just d- destroy them. Right, now that you mentioned it, yeah. I, I could see Mischief Nazis doing, like, okay against some of the lower tier villains, but yeah. They'd like, be good at mischief. If this was if uh, this was a Home Alone contest. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> when the robbers try to open this door, they'll find it rigged with explosives. Mischief I-5. <laughs> yeah. um, actually, Mischief C4. As far as I'm aware, like, there is no proof that Ven Pelt can be killed. Mm, like, yeah. he may just be a c- construct of the game, or even a concept that is unkillable. Well, and I feel like Ven Pelt just he is just resourceful enough and is good enough that he would wreck the Nazis. He would oh, yeah, the Mischief them. Nazis. Yeah. Yeah, like I think, like I think the only one taking Van Pelt down is Komodo, and that depends on how many people Komodo's killed up until that point. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, so the mischief Nazis go right at the bottom of the list. Wah, yep, wah. That, that's where they that's where they are at spot number eight, with plenty of room to still fall. Oh boy, <laughs> they're gonna fall. I really feel like. I, okay, I'm really excited for this next part because I think we got some real contenders with us this this week. So, do we just add a person each time, or should we just like group off like groupings of like eight from now on and have them fight, and then have a final a final bout of the survivors? Oh, for who dies first? Uh, let's see, like how convoluted we can get this. <laughs> chain I think. Of murder. I think. I. I think. I think District 1 has decided their victors. I think we save up for a District 2 round. All right. All right. I think it's something special we can provide every seven episodes or so. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, yeah. And then at who knows when, we'll get ourselves um, a, a match of the districts. Though, obviously, District 1 is pretty str- is a pretty strong power couple. 
listeners at home will have to make sure to tune yeah, into episode what? seven if they want to know who that is. Uh, is there anything else people want to talk about? Do people who like the movie want to say anything more? It was a good movie, and Tepper is wrong. It's uh, just because he's not a history buff. It tickled several of my things, uh, being like rural country witches and um, Nazi fighting. So I'm on board. All right. If only he was into history, though, like he would just understand it so much more. <laughs> Especially World War Two. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a real shame. You guys are a bunch of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that brings us to our arbitrary ratings that get less arbitrary when Jeff's here, but he's not. You're stuck with us. So, Chris, what did you think of the movie? Uh, I give it uh, three taps and one quarter turn. Out of a magical psychedelic voyage. All right, Connor. Uh, I give it one blue glass shiv out of <laughs> like this bundle of string. <laughs> out of a kid's pocket. <laughs> Tepper. Um, I'll give it one big, beautiful magic bed that travels through time and space. Um, out of zero, I don't know. All right, and I'll give it. I give this movie uh, three lovable kids out of one woman. Am I right? <laughs> it was one lovable kid. That's irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I meant sorry. I meant one a lo- lovable adult male and a bed out of women. Am I right, fellas? <laughs> <laughs> Please join Professor Amelius Brown on the Blue Collar Comedy Tour. <laughs> <laughs> I've been your host, Ivan. I'm Chris. I'm Connor. And I'm Tepper. And you can find us on this podcast or our other exploits on downloadablezebras.com. And a special thanks to 8-Bit Jazz for the use of our theme song. You can find them on YouTube or follow the link in the description.